Okay, so the last video in chapter 17 is about solubility equilibria, which we have already talked about in chapter 13 when we learned about solubility rules and some of the vocab. And then um, I used it again as an example in um, chapter 15. So we're going to revisit the same ideas again, and this slide is taken directly from chapter 13. So hopefully it's a good review for you. Um, but basically, when I s look at this FET simulation, which by the way, if you turn this into presentation mode, you can click on this and mess with it yourself um, from the Google document. But um, All right, so what we see here is that if you have a slightly soluble salt, um, we looked at this one in chapter 13 and we let it sit for a long time. This is the one that turns into a hexagon if you let it go. But initially when you sprinkle stuff into here, the ions break apart. So we had two words for that, ionization or dissociation. They can, use, they can be applied to the situation equally. And then of course, if I keep going, Eventually, I'm going to get a precipitate at the bottom. That's a saturated solution. So you guys, this is relevant for lab. Um, when you measure the saturated lime water, if you don't see chunks of solid floating in there or sitting at the bottom, then it wasn't a saturated solution. That would definitely impact your pH measurement. So think about that when you're thinking about what to include in your conclusion. Hopefully you observed something like that. Um, Okay, and so then when we go back to the notes, we can see the first process is dissolving, but also called dissociation or ionization. Um, the solution is saturated when you have a solid at the bottom. When it becomes saturated, that's when equilibrium is established. So that process um, is having your solid. In this case, we have, uh, I chose, what did I pick? Strontium phosphate, so SR plus two. Phosphate is a minus three, so we're going to have three strontiums, two phosphates to make that work out. This, uh, when we talked about solubility equilibrium before, I said your saturated solutions always have the solid on the left-hand side. That's because when you write the K, the denominator goes away. Otherwise, you're working with one over something, which is annoying. All right, so like in this case, oh, two plus. Uh, and there'll be two of those. So whatever was a subscript has become a coefficient because these pieces are going to break up. So if we just draw like a little sketch, here's three strontiums. I'm not going to draw the, the structure of what phosphate looks like. You can look at some prior notes for that, but I'm just going to draw it as a purple ball. So what we're representing here is we have this solid where everything is connected to each other. I didn't draw it that way, but that's what it's supposed to be when it ionizes, when you put it into water, okay, so you're going to end up with three, three red balls that are floating wherever they want to, and two purple ones that are also floating wherever they want to. Okay. Okay, I tried to make them so they're obviously connected to each other, but it didn't work out so well. You get the idea, right? So in reality, these would actually be forming those hexagonal shapes that we saw because that's the crystal structure. But, um, you know, having in your mind that the solid particles are all touching each other, all the atoms, and this is the ratio in this particular example. And then when you dissolve them, they all spread out and they get surrounded by water. That's something from chapter 13 that you still should have in your head. And so when we do the solubility equilibrium reaction here, you can see that the, the ions on the right are the aqueous ones and the one on the left is solid. All right. And so equilibrium is achieved whenever you stop seeing the amount of the ions change. And we, of course, observe that nothing stopped. Everything is still happening. Okay. So. Okay, so thinking about a different salt, if we're looking at um, silver bromide, I want you to be able to tell me what the equilibrium reaction is. So this is gonna be in a learning check, number five. That's not how you spell learning. <laughs> so basically you're just gonna, you're just gonna write out what the equilibrium will look like, kind of using the last example to help you. 
once you know that, you can write the equilibrium expression, right? And so that's where I'm going to go back to the other slide, and we can do that for our example. One at a time is really annoying. Okay. So if this is our equilibrium, our expression, we call this, by the way, an SP for solubility product. So the expression is still reactants over products. With our, co our um, coefficients also included. Our product, though, is a solid. And if you remember, when we first talked about what an equilibrium um, expression would be, we don't include things that are pure, solids, liquids, and gases. Unless you're talking about a KP, then you can include gases. So that means that we're done with this one. That is the K um, for this, this reaction. Okay. So you're going to do the same thing with AGBR. Um, you got to write out the reaction and then you got to write your K expression. Um, and you're going to put those into the learning check number five. Okay. Maybe some of you have been working on the lab, so this might um, remind you of some things. But let's look at calcium hydroxide here. Saturated lime water has a solubility expression with the solid on the left again, and the two ions on the right. All right, so once we have established the equilibrium reaction, then we can talk about the K. This is a solubility because it was saturated. So that means no denominator again. And of course, that's squared because we have a two there. OK. So I'm going to do a practice problem just like you will do in the lab. I'm going to make up numbers so it's not going to match, but you can, um, you can use it to help guide you in doing your work. So first off, we will measure a pH. Let's say for this one that we measure, I don't know, we measure that. I made it up. I hope it doesn't match yours. Maybe it does. I don't know. Um, it's definitely going to be a base, though, because we have the hydroxide right there. Um, so the, I think the easiest way to follow this program problem, it's not the only way, but the easiest thing to do is just immediately go into pOH because our, our equilibrium has hydroxide in it. And so we end up with 2.21 is our pOH. And then, of course, we can find the hydroxide ion concentration by going 10 to the negative 2.21. We find out that there was 0 0.00617. That's molarity. All right. And so um, that's how much hydroxide we have present. The calcium is going to be half of that, right? So like if you just think about it as moles for a second. Here you have to cancel OH minus to get it into calcium. And so that's going to be half as much as you have for the hydroxide. All right. And so you can figure out that the calcium ion is going to be the point zero zero divided by two. So point zero zero three zero eight. That's a zero. Is going to be the molarity of the calcium. So to figure out a calculated KSP, I just take those values. And that's squared, OK? So the number one mistake here is people will forget to square this. I've said that a bunch of times, but it's still true. I've seen you guys do it even recently. So be careful about that. Um, so to find our theoretical value, all I have to do is square the hydroxide multiplied by the calcium. And in this particular randomly chosen example, we end up with 
um, that KSP. KSPs don't have a molarity because uh, it's supposed to be a ratio. So it's just, we just leave the units off of the Ks. But so that's it. And then when you look in Appendix D, the KSPs are listed on the second page. So you have KAs on the first page, then KBs, the top of the next page. And below that is all the KSPs. So we look up calcium hydroxide and it says, not cadmium hydroxide, that's different. Um, but calcium hydroxide is 6.5 times 10 to the negative six. That's from the textbook. So I'm gonna do that in green. This is what we would call the theoretical or the reference KSP. I already forgot it. 6.5 times 10 to the negative six. Um, so to do a percent error here, you're going to take those two numbers and subtract them. And then divide by the theoretical of 6.5 times 10 to the negative 6. And then, so the part people forget about is the, is the percentage. So, right, like you're going to do The absolute value of these numbers, oh, that's one seven. Divided by the value from the text. This whole term needs to be multiplied by 100 to make it into a percentage. And a lot of people are skipping that step. You can end up with more than 100% error, right? It's not like a test. It just means that something was really far off in your measurement. And depending on which of all your Ks end up off and how they're off, whether they're high or low, you can draw some conclusions about various parts of your experiment, such as how well did you make the solutions? Was your lime water actually saturated? Um, how well did you calibrate? So like calibration errors are obvious if all of your case, acids, bases, and solubility are shifted high or low. If on the other hand, you find that say like your bases are a lot higher than your acid, that's probably less calibration error. Although maybe if you don't recalibrate with the pH 10 buffer, maybe that is an error too. Um, the farther you get from the pHs at which you calibrate, the less accurate your reading will be. So that's a consideration. But you also need to remember things like in the textbook, the appendix is assuming a temperature of exactly 25 degrees. Also standard conditions have particular expectations for concentration and pressure and um, all kinds of other things that enter into there. It's not human error, which is not a thing anyway. It's not just the instrument that's the problem, right? You have to think fundamentally about how you made the solutions, how you measured the pHs, um, yeah, lots and lots and lots of sources for error. Also, what did you make the solutions with? Are they, you know, pure water? Probably not. Okay. So anyways, that's an example problem for our solubility equilibriums. The last little bit of this chapter is, is really applicable to qual scheme. So I'm going to cover that one in a different video. I was going to do it in this one, but I've decided to break it up. So if you need to reference them separately, you can.